For the last several weeks, uh, months really, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, coming again and again to the Master on the Mountain as he teaches us the way of life that we would never find on our own. We would never find this by human reason. But we also would never find it by human willpower. We are in the last, this is the second to last sermon uh, that I'm going to do in this series on the Sermon on the Mount. Second to last. And unless there's one more. Anyway. Uh, but we're, we're almost done. At this point in the sermon, Jesus is, you know, like rounding, home, rounding third and heading for home. He is just about to offer the invitation, you know, the conviction thoughts of, hey, do you intend to actually do anything with this or not? That's what comes next. But before he gets to that, he wants to make sure that we've got it. And so he gives us this summary statement that we have hung this nice little moniker on the golden rule. We teach the golden rule to children, don't we? Because after all, it's child's play. (laughs) No, it ain't. This is a summary, Jesus says, of the entire Bible. I called this sermon the Cliff Notes sermon. Do you remember Cliff Notes? You remember those? I think they've changed to Sparks Notes. You know, although maybe Sparks is just a competitor with Cliff. I don't know. I'm not in high school right now. Are Cliff Notes still out there? Uh, Cliff Notes and Sparks Notes? That what they're supposed to be is for the really diligent student who really wants to understand the material. Right? So they're, they're going to read The Sound and the Fury, which Faulkner clearly wrote while drunk. And they're going to read that, but they're also going to read the Cliff's Notes so that they can understand Faulkner's ramblings. They want to get deep in. They want to un- really get it. Right? That's what the Cliff Notes are for. That's how you used them, didn't you? Didn't you? <laughs> no, you didn't. It's, it, that is, <laughs> they are the summary uh, so that you can pass the test. You know, that's what the cliff notes are. It is, it is the boiled down summary of the work, you know. Now, I think actually Jesus is giving us a cliff notes of the Bible right here. Not so that we don't have to read the rest of it, but so that we'll use it the way that the diligent student is supposed to use the spark notes. So that we get this. See, what it's supposed to be for is you read that thing and then you go, okay. This is really hard. This is pretty simple. I'll read this so that I can understand the hard thing. And so what Jesus has done is He's given us a really simple summary. In fact, He says this is the Law and the Prophets. Remember what the Master has been doing all along. What the King has been doing all along is what kings are supposed to do in Israel, which is explain the will of God as it's understood from the Scriptures. This whole sermon is Jesus saying, okay, I'm your king. Let me interpret the law to you. Remember in Deuteronomy 17, the king is supposed to make a copy by hand of the law. He's supposed to read it every day. And that's his job. It's the big job of kings. was to be the interpreters of the will of God. And so here, he's doing what kings were always supposed to do and probably never did do until he came along. And here he is standing in front of them and he's saying, I want you to understand the will of God as it's revealed in the Scriptures. Let me give you a handle on it. A way to read this whole thing so that you'll understand it. And what is it? Whatever you would have people do to you, you do that to them. No wonder we teach it to children. It's incredibly simple, right? That's easy enough. Your own heart becomes a barometer for understanding the will of God. I mean, nobody likes to be abused or mistreated, and so if you don't want to be abused and mistreated, don't abuse other people. And now, nobody wants to be in desperate circumstances and to be ignored, so if you see somebody in desperate circumstances, don't ignore them. No one wants to be shunned and left out of a group, so don't leave anybody out. Nobody wants to be hated. Everybody wants to be loved, so you love everybody. It's simple, right? Simple. So you try to do it. Remember everything that he said. When he says, this is the Law and the Prophets, what has he been doing? He's been interpreting the Law and the Prophets the entire time. The whole sermon is an interpretation of the Law and the Prophets. So as he's wrapping up, he says, look, if you want something to memorize, to remember as you leave the mountain, as you walk down off the mountain, just remember that what you're supposed to be doing is whatever you would want people doing to you. Because, do you like it when people hate you? Do you want people to be angry with you? You want people to just let their anger fly. You love that, don't you? 
Every encounter with an angry person is something that you have cherished, right? Well, you may have cherished it in a way because you probably held on to it for a while and you thought about it and talked to people about it and you stewed over it and you were really resentful and maybe angry in response. But you didn't cherish it because it was good. You ever been mistreated and abused and used as resource or tool or object of somebody else's desires and hungers rather than as person? Did you enjoy that? And you don't lust either. You ever have somebody lie to you and deceive you and, and fool you? You ever been there? Maybe at great cost to you? You ever buy a lemon? I don't mean from Ingalls. I mean from a car lot. You ever had that experience? Where you really are pretty sure they knew it was a lemon? You know, they rolled back those numbers? If you don't like people doing that to you, then don't you do that to them. You see how this is summary of the whole thing? If, if somebody were to respond to you when you were bad, you mistreated them and you were bad to them, and they were good to you, wouldn't that just overwhelm and surprise you? Don't you wish someone would do that? So maybe you do that to them. You know, and, and do you want people to hate you? No, you don't. So don't hate. It's all simple in theory, but you try to put it into practice and you discover almost immediately that it is incredibly, incredibly hard. Let me take a step for a moment out of the sermon and go instead of at the beginning of Matthew to the very end, well, not the very end, but almost to the end, to those last days of Jesus' life, and ask you, why on earth did he do that stuff? Why take the nails? Why did he do that? Did he have an itch on his wrist? No. Why make it hard to breathe? I mean, he is, after all, master of the universe. The Holy Spirit, the very breath of God, resides in him without measure. Why be at a point where breathing becomes challenging? You know that's how crucifixion kills you, right? Holds your chest open so you can't exhale. In order to exhale, you have to pull on nails and push on nails in order to get up high enough so your chest can relax so you can exhale. So you drown on oxygen. Well, it stops being oxygenated, but you drown on air. You know, your, your body uses it up, and it just sits there in your lungs. You become exhausted. You can't exhale. You can't draw in a new breath, and you die eventually. It's a terrible way to die. Why do that? Why did he do that for us? Well, just like the golden rule is child's play, so is that. We know why He did that for us. We're sinners. And we needed the forgiveness of God. We needed a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, because ultimately the, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. And we needed our sin removed. We had a really serious problem. And folks, I would never minimize that. Of course that's why He died. But is that all? When the temple was first dedicated, do you, do you know what, what they had to do? Or when the tabernacle was first getting set up, before they could use it, do you know what they needed to do? They had to go in there with blood to purify the space. Blood was seen, the blood of those animals was seen as a cleansing agent. They would throw it about. And they would sprinkle it a way that, that God told them to so that the space could be cleansed in the eyes of the people. They could understand that a sacrifice had been made and whatever wickedness and evil might reside in this universe could be driven away from it. And then it could be prepared for the Spirit of God to descend into it and rest among the people. You realize that the pouring out that happened on Pentecost of the Holy Spirit of God had to come after the cross. It could not come before. Because the blood had to be given to purify the temple. And you are that temple. So the Holy Spirit had to have that cleansing before He could come and live in us. He could come and spend time with us. Sure, He could He could in. in he did it in the Old Testament a lot, where he falls on somebody like the, the King Saul who starts speaking in tongues. That's, that's the result of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Or Samson, who comes you know, upon people and he rushes and he's filled with power and then he kills a whole bunch of people. Gross. 
know, but that's that's the spirit. But the spirit would come and then the spirit would go. But into that temple he descended, and into us he was poured out. What's he doing in there? Do you suppose? Is he looking for a vacation home? Place to kick back? You know, the, the Holy Spirit would come, sure, and He'd reside in us, and He'd watch, and He'd say, good luck. I hope you get your Scriptures right. Study them hard, because you know it's up to you. Jesus already did God's part. And your part is to live right. You better do it. If that were the case, what on earth was He poured out for? Why did they stress the permanence of it? Why would Paul go to such an extent is to say that if anybody does not have the Spirit of God, they don't belong to Christ. What's He for? This is what He's for. The reason that, that, that we need to be baptized into the blood of Jesus Christ and raised out of it and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the reason we need that is because we need help. You cannot do the golden rule that you teach to children. You cannot do it on your own. You can't. But Christian, you're not on your own. So the Holy Spirit of God is there to help us to do the impossible teachings of Jesus. And frankly, all of the Sermon on the Mount, if you read that and go, yeah, I can do that, let me follow you around with a video camera. Because no, you can't. None of us do this very... But when do you do that? See, this is the hope that one day I will be that entirely through and through. That to the core of who I am, I will not want hate. That to the core of who I am, I will not want to deceive. I won't even want to. It's not that I won't do it. It's that I won't want to. To the core of who I am, I won't want lust. I won't want the retaliation. I won't want any of the things Jesus teaches me I shouldn't be doing. But I'm not there yet. I'm still a work in progress. Are you? So this is why the Holy Spirit, why Jesus died for us. It was to save us, but it was also to help us. And what Jesus has set in front of us in the Sermon on the Mount is what you can become with the help of the Holy Spirit. And the more that you engage with Him, the more you will become like those teachings. And I'll tell you, folks, the golden rule is the wonderful test. It's wonderful to show you how you're doing. It's a beautiful barometer because, as Jesus said, this is the summary of the whole thing. This is the law and the prophets. You want to know what God's leading you to? Do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, it's it's worth taking a note of a couple things that he didn't say. That I honestly kind of would prefer it if he had. Like, do unto others, don't do unto others what you don't want them doing to you. That would be easier, right? Because then what it would be is that my heart would be restrained from bad behavior. And for the most part, so many of us Christians, that's the goal. Don't sin. Quit being naughty. Okay, that is not the call of God. It's a good starting place, sure. I mean, God doesn't say, sin a lot. No, He doesn't say that, okay? But He also doesn't say, quit it. Okay? That's not the goal. I mean, it, yes, it is, obviously. I don't want to go around murdering people. I don't want to go around hating people. I don't want to do that stuff. But he didn't set in front of us, whatever you don't want done to you, don't do to other people, because that is not the law and the prophets. It's not a high enough goal. And it's what too many of us are shooting for. Look, as long as you were just trying to restrain evil, you are not confronting evil. And the way that you overcome evil is not just that you don't respond with evil to evil, but you overcome evil with good. So the the golden rule comes to us not saying, hey, don't do bad stuff. That's just assumed. Of course you're not going to do that. But how? 
Because my wicked heart wants to run off and do it, doesn't yours? We need the Holy Spirit's even to get to what He didn't tell us. We need the Holy Spirit's help. Another thing that He didn't tell us is do unto others as they did unto you, which honestly is the far more common human ethic. You know, we'll never articulate that because it sounds gross, right? Revenge and retaliation, nobody enjoys it, nobody likes it. It's ugly in other people and we don't like it in ourselves, but it is the way that most of fallen humanity functions. And this is what I mean. If you're good to me, it's easy for me to give you good back. If you're bad to me, what's easy? Look out. That's simple. And and it makes sense of so much human behavior, doesn't it? Do unto others as they did unto you. You know, if you gave me bad, look out. But as long as I enjoy you, I'm going to be out for your good. The Christian ethic is simple to participate with our friends. In fact, we enjoy them and and we we want to be good to them. So they're not a challenge. The challenge comes when somebody does what they ought not do. And then you find yourself going, man, I can figure out what to do about that. Let let me put my gray matter to work a little bit because I I don't want to get caught being bad. But I can find the way to stick the knife in that they'll blame somebody else. We... Our hearts are weasels. We, we don't want to be evil. We just are. Which is why the ethic that comes to us has got to be so very lofty. What you wouldn't want somebody doing to you, that's what you do to other people. Now, like I said, that's beautiful until you start trying to put that into practice. Right? You're, just imagine you're having a horrible day. A really bad day. You woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Your bed's against the wall. You still woke up on the wrong side, right? You rolled over into that wall and hit your face. You get up, and the coffee maker's busted, and you're late because the alarm didn't go off on time, and you got to get there, and you get there late to the meeting, and, you know, the meeting goes horribly. You don't land the client, and your lunch was burned. It was cooked by an incompetent rube at Taco Bell, and they overcharged you, they didn't give you your bean burrito. And you get back to the office and you're just furious and you go through the rest of your day and everyone is incompetent and stupid and then you get home. And your spouse is an idiot. And at that moment, you blow your top. And you call out everything that they've ever done wrong. For the last ten years, everything that they ever did wrong. And you stomp off to bed and you lay down. And then you remember that you just did that. So you go out to the couch with your blanket and you're grouchy. Now, how do you want to be treated in that moment? What do you want from your spouse? What you don't want is for them to tell you everything you've ever done wrong for the last 10 years or 11 because you gave 10. So they're going to go back a little further. You don't want that. I want them matching your evil with their evil. What you would want is someone to come to you with graciousness and gentleness and sit down and say, what on earth is going on? What's happened to you? And maybe they would find out about Taco Bell. You know, maybe they would find out about the... the the teenager was so rude at Taco Bell and shorted you a burrito. And how you lost the client. And how you hit your face at the very beginning of the whole day. You want, But you know what? That's stinking hard, isn't it? When someone is bad to you, you don't want to give them any good at all. But you know good and well that if you've had that horrible day and it's provoked you into bad behavior and you're out of sorts and your temper's bad, what you need is love. Right? Your own heart tells you that. You know good and well that what you need is someone to be patient with you and talk to you. Oh, but you... That's what you need. That's not what they need. Not what your spouse needs. What your spouse needs is good lecture not to be such a jerk. Right? Because they've just been horrible to switch the roles. I don't care what kind of day you've had. 
That wasn't fair. Do you see why the golden rule is hard? Because what it calls for you to do is to look at a badly behaving person. A person who comes to you and is just bad. They blow it all over the place. You know, they provoke an argument with you. You know, they 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 Facebook rant into your face. And you have to be in control. And you have to say, okay, well, I don't know where they are, but if I were there, how would I want to be treated? And that's not just your spouse. That's every person you encounter. As my, bro- my brother Hugh says, everyone is carrying a bag of rocks. And you can't see them. And so often what we end up doing is throwing their rocks right back at them. You see how hard the golden rule is? It calls for you to love the unlovable. It calls for you to be good in response to evil. It calls for you to say, if I were where you are, how would I want to be treated? It calls for an absolute removal of all restraint on resources. If you were hungry, how would you want to be treated? If you were poor, how would you want to be treated? If you had you know, your, your whole world ruined and blown up and you were inconvenient and hostile and bad, how would you want to be treated? If you were captured in a false theology so that you were, you were a Muslim terrorist, would you want to be hated? No. And so our response to everything, do you realize that if you put this into practice, there are no hateable people. Are you ever hateable? Do you ever deserve to be? Well, you might. <laughs> do you ever want it? No, you don't ever want to be hated. You don't ever want to be on the out. You don't ever want to be excluded. You don't want to ever be the treatment of bad behavior. You don't ever want that. So if that's true, however you'd want what you want done to you, that's what you have to now do for them. You have to feed the hungry. You have to clothe the naked. You have to visit the sick and those in prison. Why? Because if you were there, that's what you'd want done for you. You have to be patient with the angry. You have to be you know, pure with the impure. You have to be kind with the unkind. Why? Because if that were you, and you were in whatever bad circumstances are driving their mess, if you had the pile of sin on you that they have, you would want a kind, good, loving, understanding, responsive person who would be your friend. So that's what you do. So it's not asking all that much, right? You understand why I bring up the cross of Jesus Christ now? When you look at that ethic and how incredibly lofty it is, and by the way, that's summary of the entire Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the most powerful, beautiful ethic that's ever been put in front of humanity. It's gorgeous, but it's impossible for fallen creatures to carry out on their own. So you need the cross. You need the blood of Christ Jesus. This is why you need baptism into the Lord. You need the Holy Spirit. And you need to be near to Him. You need to have a heart open to Him. You need to be submissive to Him. You need to be calling on Him for help. Because He is ever-present, ever-ready, and always wants to help you. He empowers those who seek His face. And He makes us strong. And what does our strength look like? The Sermon on the Mount. We become by the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, what we can only be by the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes every bit of our effort to do it. It's not like you go, okay, well, I'll I'll just sit on the horse and let him drive. No, that's not how it works. The Holy Spirit empowers you and lifts you up, but you have to use that strength and power in order to do it. So you're working hard, but you're working with someone who is so much stronger than you. And the good news is, you're not stronger than sin, but He is. And so by His strength, and by His power, and by His might, you actually can do to others what you would want done to you. By the power of God, the Holy Spirit among us, and by the blood of Jesus Christ, 
You can forgive. You can let it go. You can show kindness. You can be good. You can be a creature that loves first. But only by the power of God and the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way to do it. And you may be able to be a pretty nice guy most of the time. But overcoming the wickedness of a broken, sinful heart, that's God's specialty, not yours. And nothing reminds us more profoundly of our incredible need than does Jesus' simple words. Whatever you would have someone do to you, do also to them, because this is the law and the prophets. When you look into yourself, as I encourage us to do every week, and by the way, I... I'm always looking in here too. I know how far I have to go. You don't have a clue how far I've got, but I'm, I have some clue. I don't know entirely, but man, do I know. There's still work. But as you look into yourself, are you resistant to the work of the Spirit in you? Is there a place where you're captured by something that Jesus teaches against? Is there somewhere where you're stuck in a weakness that you don't want to give up because it would call for too much for you? Do you look into yourself this week? If you need the prayers of the church, and folks, all of us need prayer sometimes, let us know. And if there's something going on in your heart and it's overwhelming and painful and and you just you feel the weight of it, but it has nothing to do with what I talked about today. The church wants to minister to you. We so do. God wants to minister to you. Let us do it. And if you're not following Jesus Christ, His way is the best. It's hard, but it's beautiful. And it's the way that goes on forever. Join us. Let's follow that man together. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of God, why don't you come right here, right now, while we stand and sing.